men bound by a secret oath to labor in the cause of world democracy, decided that in the American colonies they would plant the roots of a new way of life. Brotherhoods were established to meet secretly, and they quietly and industriously conditioned America to its destiny for leadership in a free world. Benjamin Franklin exercised an enormous psychological influence in colonial politics as the appointed spokesman of the unknown philosophers. He did not make laws, but his words became law. Colonization of the Western Hemisphere was largely motivated in the desire to pillage the fabulous treasures of the New World. The explorers, led on by legends of hordes of gold and silver, and palaces encrusted with jewels, formed expeditions often financed from their own purses, but sometimes subsidized by the state. The Spanish were the most successful in their quest for riches. The majority of the other adventurers profited little and suffered much, and it soon became apparent that only by sober colonization was any sizable reward to be gained in the New World. For the promulgation of the Christian faith, the Western Hemisphere offered virgin territory. With the conquistadors came priests eager to convert pagan tribes and nations to the faith of the Old World. A holy inquisition was set up in New Spain, and Indians by the tens of thousands were tortured and killed for the good of their immortal souls. It was due to the zeal of the priests that the libraries of the Mayans were burned and their historical records destroyed. To this day, there stands in Merida, on the peninsula of Yucatan, the house of the conquistador Montejo. Over the door of this house are the heraldic arms of this Spanish adventurer. The shield and crest are upheld by Spanish soldiers standing on the heads of tortured and enslaved Mayan Indians. Reasonably accurate accounts of the natural advantages and resources of the Americas were in time brought back by the explorers and adventurers who had opened the new territories of the West, and only then did the European nations give serious consideration to actual development of their newly acquired colonial empires. The French, the Dutch, and the English entered upon programs of establishing permanent settlements along the Atlantic seaboard. The English program was under the direction of Sir Francis Bacon and it was his genius that gave purpose to the enterprise. Bacon quickly realized that here in the New World was the proper environment for the accomplishment of his great dream, the establishment of the philosophic empire. It must be remembered that Bacon did not play a lone hand. He was the head of a secret society, including in its membership the most brilliant intellectuals of his day. All these men were bound together by a common oath to labor in the cause of a world democracy. Bacon's society of the unknown philosophers included men of high rank and broad influence. Together with Bacon, they devised the colonization scheme. Word was passed about through secret channels that here in the Western Hemisphere was the promised land of the future. Here, men of right purpose could build a new way of life, free from the religious intolerance and political despotism that held Europe in its clutches. The history books tell us that the colonists made the long and dangerous journey in small ships in order to find a place where they could worship God, each according to the dictates of his own conscience. There is, however, much more to the story than our historians have dared to suggest. Among the colonizers were some who belonged to the Order of the Quest, but it was not long before religious strife broke out in the colonies, for men do not change their natures merely by changing their place of habitation. Much of the intolerance of the old world came over to plague the beginnings of the new civilization. It was not easy to preserve high principles in pioneering a country. A lot had to be done before the philosophic empire could emerge out of the simple struggle for existence, and much has yet to be accomplished. We are still pioneering in the sphere of right thinking and right living. Bacon's secret society was set up in America before the middle of the 17th century. Bacon himself had given up all hope of bringing his dream to fruition in his own country, and he concentrated his attention upon rooting it in the New World. He made sure that the American colonists were thoroughly indoctrinated with the principles of religious tolerance, political democracy, and social equality. Through carefully appointed representatives, the machinery of democracy was set up at least a hundred years before the period of the Revolutionary War. Bacon's secret society membership was not limited to England. It was most powerful in Germany, in France, and in the Netherlands, and most of the leaders of European thought were involved in the vast pattern of his purpose. The mystic empire of the wise had no national boundaries, and its citizenry was made up of men of good purpose in every land. 
The alchemists, Kabbalists, mystics, and Rosicrucians were the incisive instruments of Bacon's plan. Representatives of these groups migrated to the colonies at an early date and set up their organization in suitable places. One example will indicate the trend. About 1690, the German pietist theologian, Magistar Johannes Kelpius, sailed for America with a group of followers, all of whom practiced mystical and esoteric rites. The pietists settled in Pennsylvania, and their descendants still flourish in Lancaster County. Kelpius, for some years, lived as an anchorite in a cave located in what is now Fairmount Park, Philadelphia. The pietists brought with them the writings of the German mystic, Jacob Boehm, books on magic, astrology, alchemy, and the Kabbalah. They had curious manuscripts illuminated with strange designs, and their principal text was called an ABC book for young students studying in the College of the Holy Ghost. The pietists brought the order of the mustard seed and the order of the woman in the wilderness to the new world. Kelpius was a man of feeble health and, after a few years, died from the hardships and exposures of his religious austerity. The inner circle of his order was composed entirely of celibates, and as these died, there were none to take their places. And so far as the public knows, his secret society did not survive. Actually, it did continue, but with the changing of the times, it returned again to its secret foundations, disappearing entirely from the public view. The early years of the 18th century brought with them many changes in the social and political life of the American colonies. By this time, most of the Atlantic seaboard was dominated by the English. Cities had sprung up, important trade flourished with the mother country, and the colonial atmosphere was in small counterpart that of the English countryside. By this time, most of the important secret societies of Europe were well represented in this country. The brotherhoods met in their rooms over inns and similar public buildings, practicing their ancient rituals exactly according to the fashion in Europe and England. These American organizations were branches under European sovereignty, with the members in the two hemispheres bound together with the strongest bonds of sympathy and understanding. The program that Bacon had outlined was working out according to schedule. Quietly and industriously, America was being conditioned for its destiny, leadership in a free world. Any account of secret societies in America would have to include tribute to the man who has been called the first American gentleman, Benjamin Franklin. Although Dr. Franklin was never the country's president nor a military general, he stands out as one of the most important figures in the struggle for American independence. Quiet, dignified, scholarly, and gentle, Franklin foresaw a new goal for an ever-changing world through the square bifocal glasses of which he was the inventor. Historians have never ceased to wonder at the enormous psychological influence which Franklin exercised in colonial politics, but up to the present day, few indeed are those who have realized that the source of his power lay in the secret societies to which he belonged and of which he was the appointed spokesman. Franklin was not a lawmaker, but his words became law. Beneath the homely wisdom which he circulated in his almanac under the pseudonym of Poor Richard was a profundity of scientific and philosophic learning. He understood both the farmer and the philosopher and could speak the languages of both. When Benjamin Franklin went to France to be honored by the state, he was received too by the Lodge of Perfection, the most famous of all the French secret orders, and his name, written in his own fine hand, is in their record ledger close to that of the Marquis de Lafayette. Franklin spoke for the Order of the Quest, and most of the men who worked with him in the early days of the American Revolution were also members. The plan was working out. The new Atlantis was coming into being, in accordance with the program laid down by Francis Bacon a 150 years earlier. The rise of American democracy was necessary to a world program. At the appointed hour, the freedom of man was publicly declared. 14. A Prophecy Written in the Year of Washington's Birth Sir William Hope noted the birth overseas of an infant starred by fate to rule both free men and slaves, and named the Year of the American Declaration of Independence, 44 years before it was signed. He gave in Kabbalistic form the Patriot leader's name and the years of his lifetime span. The prophecy also singled out Abraham Lincoln, designated the term of Benjamin Harrison as the one to mark the first century of the new nation's progress. 
It is a reasonable assumption that the Hulk prophecy is a genuine example of foreknowledge of the destiny of the United States. George Washington had just been born when the governor of Edinburgh Castle wrote a prophecy that this infant, born overseas, was starred by fate to lead the colonies to freedom. This prediction also named, four decades in advance, the year of the Declaration of Independence. In the Congressional Library at Washington, D.C. is a curious little book entitled Vindication of the True Art of Self-Defense. It is a work on fencing and dueling, published in 1724 by Sir William Hope, a deputy governor of Edinburgh Castle. In this copy, and facing the title page, an engraving has been inserted of the badge of the Royal Society of Swordsmen. Underneath, it is written, Private Library of Sir William Hope. The Library of Congress has had this book since 1879. The text of this curious little book is of no special interest, but on the blank flyleaves is written in the hand of Sir William Hope, an extraordinary prediction concerning the destiny of the United States of America. It was written, signed, and dated 44 years before the beginning of the Revolutionary War. At the time, the 13 American colonies seemingly had no dream of independence. George Washington had just been born in Virginia. 20 of the 56 men who were to sign the Declaration of Independence were then small boys, and 18 others were yet unborn. Little information is available concerning Sir William Hope, but from the text of his prediction, it appears that he was devoted to the study of astrology and based his strange prophetic poem upon an interpretation of the starry influences. There is also a hint of the Kabbalah in the manner used by Hope to indicate the men referred to in his prediction. The prophecy of Sir William Hope begins with these lines. Tis Chaldee says his fate is great, whose stars do bear him fortunate. Of thy near fate, America, I read in stars a prophecy. Fourteen divided, twelve the same, sixteen in halves, each holds a name. Four, eight, seven, six, added ten, the lifeline's mark of four great men. From the text, the prophecy covers the period from 1732 to 1901. From the history of our country during this period of time, Hope selected four men, and the numbers which he used to indicate them are shown as the prophecy unfolds. He summarizes the lives of these four men by totaling the number of years that each lived. He does this in the line 4, 8, 7, 6, added 10. 4 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 equal 25. The added 10 is the cipher, making a total of 250. At the time of his death, George Washington was 68, Abraham Lincoln 56, Benjamin Harrison 68, and William McKinley 58. The total of these years is 250. The next 12 lines are devoted to a description of George Washington and the struggle of the American colonies for independence. This day is cradled far beyond the sea, one starred by fate to rule both bond and free. The prophecy is dated 1732, and in that year George Washington was born beyond the sea in Virginia. The reference to bond and free is believed to indicate that slavery would exist during Washington's time in the colony of Virginia. Add double four, thus fix the destined day, when servile knees unbend neath freedom's sway. By double four we can read 44, which, if added to the date 1732, gives 1776 the year of the American Declaration of Independence. Place six four ten. Then read the Patriot's name, whose deeds shall link him to a deathless fame. Add double four, thus fix the destined day. There are six letters in the name George, and ten in Washington, and this Kabbalah, when added to the previous and subsequent descriptions, can leave no doubt as to the man intended in the prophecy. Whose growing love and ceaseless trust wrong none, and catch truth's colors from its glowing sun, Death's door shall clang while yet his century waits, as planets point the way to others' pending fates. These lines contain not only a glowing tribute, but an exact bit of prophecy. Washington died on December 14, 1799, just 17 days before his century passed into history, till all the names on freedom's scroll shall fade, two tombs be built, his lofty cenotaph be made.
Freedom Scroll is the Declaration of Independence, which is now carefully preserved under yellow cellophane because these signatures have begun to fade. The body of George Washington has rested in two tombs. His lofty cenotaph, the Washington Monument, is 555 feet high, the tallest memorial ever constructed to the memory of a man. Full six times ten, the years must onward glide. Nature, their potent help, a constant, prudent guide. If six times ten years, or sixty years, be added to the date of the death of Washington, the result is 1859, when John Brown raided Harper's Ferry and was hanged for attempting to incite a slave revolt, a circumstance leading directly to the United States of America engaging in the great civil war to preserve the freedom of all of its people. Then fateful seven, four, seven, shall sign heroic son, whom Mars and Jupiter strike down before his work is done. One cruel fate shall pierce, though artless of its sword, who leaves life's gloomy stage without one farewell word. A softly beaming star, half veiled by Mars' red cloud, virtue, his noblest cloak, shall form a fitting shroud. There are seven letters in Abraham and seven letters in Lincoln. He is the heroic son, elected to the presidency in 1860, re-elected in 1864, and assassinated April 14th, 1865. He was indeed struck down before his work was done, for slavery was not abolished by constitutional amendment until the end of that year, and the Civil War was not proclaimed to be at an end until August 20th, 1866. The reference to life's gloomy stage is the more extraordinary because Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater while watching a play. He never spoke again after the assassin's bullet struck through him, although he lived for several hours. References to President Benjamin Harrison are contained in the two following lines. Then 848, a letter generation rules, with light undimmed and shed in progress's school. There are eight letters in Benjamin and eight in Harrison. He ruled in a later generation, 1889 to 1893. His administration was justly climaxed by the Great Columbian Exposition at Chicago, in 1893. Here, invention, transportation, industry, art, science, and agriculture exhibited the progress which they had made in the first century of American national existence. This is probably the progress school referred to in the prediction. Harrison's administration was not dimmed by war or by any scandals in high office. Then six again, with added six, shall rise, resplendent ruler, good and great, and wise. Four sixes hold a glittering star that on his way shall shine, and twice four sixes mark his years from birth to manhood's prime. While the verses accurately describe President McKinley, this is the only instance in which the numbers do not appear to fit the name. Research, however, indicates that the original form of the family name would permit it to be divided thus, Will McKinley, which means Will the son of Kinley, in this form, each of the combinations would contain six letters. Four sixes, or twenty-four, agrees with President McKinley being the twenty-fourth man to hold the presidential office. And twice four sixes, or forty-eight, was the age of McKinley at the time he was elected to governor of his native state, which might be said to be his manhood's prime. There is no reference to McKinley's second term or his assassination, but the prophecy definitely states that it goes no farther than the end of the nineteenth century. It does indicate earlier, however, that McKinley's life was to be 58 years, which was correct. The prophecy ends with four more lines. These truths, prophetic shall completion see, ere time's deep grave receives the 19th century. All planets, stars, twelve signs, and horoscope attest these certain truths foretold by William Hope. Following this is the statement that the prophecy was writ at Cornhill, London, 1732. At the bottom of the page are four other lines written by some later member of the Hope family as a tribute to the memory of Sir William Hope. The learned hand that writ these lines no more shall pen for me, yet voice shall speak and pulses beat for long posterity. This soul refined through love of kind bewailed life's labor spent, then found this truth his search from youth, greatness is God's accident. James Hope
As is usual with material of this kind, efforts have been made to prove the whole prophecy to be a forgery, but up to the present time, no tangible evidence has been advanced to disprove the prediction. Always in these matters, the critic takes the attitude that such predictions cannot be made, and if a writing appears to be authentic, then it must be imposture. The book has been in the Library of Congress for more than 60 years. The prediction about both Harrison and McKinley relate to incidents taking place after the book was placed in the Congressional Library. In facsimile, one of the two pages of the original prophecy is illustrated here. Both have every appearance of being genuine and authentic. It is most reasonable to assume that the whole prophecy is a genuine example of foreknowledge concerning the future of the United States of America. 15. The Unknown Man Who Designed Our Flag Our flag was worked out in elements of design that provided for gradual modification in the future as the national destiny increased. It was a learned stranger added by seeming accident to the committee appointed by the Colonial Congress in 1775, who had the foresight to provide the area for the stars and the subsequent substitution for the British Union Jack. The design was adopted by General Washington. There is no record that the committee ever made a report to Congress. According to the rules laid down by Francis Bacon for works published under the authority of the Society of Unknown Philosophers, each book must be so marked as to be readily recognizable. The book that tells of the presence of the unknown designer ends with a quotation from Bacon. Robert Allen Campbell, in 1890, published a little book, Our Flag, or The Evolution of the Stars and Stripes. Diligent research fails to uncover any data about Mr. Campbell. He states in his preface that the work is a compilation of facts and dates from official sources, larger works, occasional pamphlets, and addresses upon this and collateral subjects, and is meant, therefore, for the perusal of those who have not the time, opportunity, or disposition for a more extended study in this line of research. Then he refers specifically to the chapter of interest to our present consideration. That part of this sketch, which treats of the proceedings of the Congressional Committee in relation to the colonial flag and of the unofficial consideration by a few of our revolutionary statesmen and heroes in regard to the flag of the 13 United States immediately preceding its adoption by Congress has not heretofore been published. This last statement makes it extremely difficult to trace Mr. Campbell's source of information. We are forced to the conclusion that the story must have been given to him by word of mouth. The book itself must have been printed in a very small edition, for it has become exceedingly scarce and is seldom, if ever, offered for sale. On those rare occasions when copies have changed hands, the book commands a price far in excess of usual works in this field. According to the rules laid down by Sir Francis Bacon for works published under the authority of the Society of Unknown Philosophers, each book must be marked in some peculiar way easily recognizable by the informed, but not conspicuous to those who are not a party to the plan. All of the older writings are so marked, either with ciphers, curious headpieces, vignettes, colophons, designs, symbols, figures, or signatures. It is possible that the book, Our Flag, carries such a signature, for it ends with the following quotation. Out of monuments, names, words, proverbs, private records, and evidences, fragments of stories, passages and books, and the like, we save and recover somewhat from the deluge of time. Bacon. One thing is certain, Robert Allen Campbell has concluded his treatise with a curiously meaningful passage from the writings of the man responsible for the broad program of colonization in the Western world that made possible the creation of the United States of America. The selection of Bacon's words to conclude the book may be accident, and it may be intent, but in the light of the text and the air of mystery which covers the history of the writing and the life of the author, it appears more than possible that intent is the answer. Chapter two of our flag is entitled, The Colonial Flag. This, in substance, is what it says. In the fall of 1775, the Colonial Congress in session at Philadelphia appointed Franklin, Lynch, and Harrison as a committee to consider and recommend a design for a colonial flag. General Washington was then in camp at Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the committee went there to consult with him. While at Cambridge, the committee men were entertained by a patriotic and well-to-do citizen, 
At that time, the best room in this gentleman's residence was temporarily occupied by a peculiar old gentleman. As there was only one other guest room, Lynch and Harrison were given the unoccupied room, and Dr. Franklin shared apartments with the old gentleman. Nothing is known about the mysterious old man except that he was referred to as the Professor. His name is not preserved. He was beyond 70 years of age, but apparently in the prime of his life. He ate no flesh, fish, nor fowl, or any green things, and drank no liquor, wine, or ale. His diet consisted of cereals, well-ripened fruit, nuts, tea, and such sweets as honey and molasses. He was well-educated, highly cultured, of extensive as well as varied information, and very studious. He spent most of his time pondering over rare books and ancient manuscripts, which he seemed to be deciphering, translating, or rewriting. These he kept carefully locked up in a heavy iron-bound chest and never showed them to any person. He was liberal, but in no ways lavish with his money, and was well supplied with all that he needed. The professor was a staunch advocate of democracy, and his favorite statement was, We demand no more than our just due. We will accept and be satisfied with nothing less than we demand. On the eve of their arrival, December 13th, the committee men dined with their host and hostess, also General Washington and the professor. The professor was introduced to the visitors without his name being given, and his ease, grace, and dignity during the introduction is especially noted. When Benjamin Franklin was presented, he stepped forward and extended his hand, which the professor heartily accepted. As their eyes met, there was an instantaneous, a very apparent, and a mutually gratified recognition. After dinner, Washington and the committee men exchanged a few words in undertone, and then Dr. Franklin arose, saying in substance, As the chairman of this committee, speaking for my associates and with their consent, and with the approval of General Washington, I respectfully invite the professor to meet with the committee as one of its members, and we, each one personally and urgently, request him to accept the responsibility and to give us, the American colonies, the benefit of his presence and his counsel. After graciously accepting the invitation, the professor made his first recommendation. He pointed out that the committee now consisted of six persons, General Washington and the host being honorary members. Six was not an auspicious number, and as none of the members could be spared, let the hostess be included so that their number could be increased to seven. This suggestion was unanimously accepted and the hostess became the secretary of the committee. The committee met the following evening in the professor's room. General Washington opened the proceedings by asking Dr. Franklin for his recommendations. Franklin replied by requesting that the entire committee listen to the words of his newfound and abundantly honored friend, the professor, who had definite suggestions to make. After a preamble, the professor made the following extraordinary remarks. The sun of our political air, like the sun in the heavens, is very low in the horizon just now approaching the winter solstice, which it will reach very soon. But, as the sun rises from his grave in Capricorn, mounts toward his resurrection in Aries, and passes onward and upward to his glorious culmination in Cancer, so will our political sun rise and continue to increase in power, in light, and in glory. And the exalted sun of summer will not have gained his full strength of heat and power in the starry lion until our colonial sun will be, in its glorious exaltation, demanding a place in the governmental firmaments alongside of, coordinate with, and in no wise subordinate to, any other son of any other nation upon earth. The professor went on to point out that the flag which he recommended would be subject to change in the future as the national destiny increased. This change, however, should not require a complete redesigning, but a process of gradual modification to make it announce and represent the new nation which is already gestating in the womb of time, and which will come to birth, and that not prematurely but fully developed and ready for the change into independent life, before the sun in its next summer's strength ripens our next harvest. The design finally submitted consisted of a field of 13 alternate red and white stripes, and in the area which now contains the stars was the British Union Jack, the area containing the Union Jack was the one suitable for modification. The design was formally and unanimously accepted, and the flag was adopted by General Washington as the recognized standard of the Colonial Army and Navy. There is no record of any report being made by this committee to Congress. On January 2, 1776, at Cambridge, 
In the presence of the army, General Washington, with his own hands, raised the newly made flag on the tall and specially prepared pine tree Liberty Pole. The British army at Charleston Heights could see the flag clearly. After inspecting it with their field glasses, the British officers ordered a salute of 13 cheers, followed by a regular official salute of 13 guns in honor of the new standard. It appears, therefore, that the colonial flag was as pleasing to the British as it was to the colonies. It is easy to see why Mr. Campbell's story has received very little recorded recognition. It belongs among those shadowy and mysterious happenings which influence or change the course of empire, but will ever find little favor with prosaic and unimaginative historians. 16. Thomas Paine and the... <clears throat>